Hey there, Brain Hackers. Dave Farrow here. I'm talking with Kevin Wayne Johnson about this upcoming incredible shift happening in uh, generationally uh, in society today. He says that uh, because of this generational shift, we are losing all of our leadership uh, in, 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 in these great institutions and that it could have repercussions in every aspect of society. So if you are a leader, if you are uh, the younger generation and you want to figure out how to fulfill that role and step into your destiny, then come listen to us right after this. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey there, how are you today? I'm doing good. So you are a best-selling author and your topic, you do a lot of coaching, consulting, really around leadership. And you specifically have this incredible dire warning about, uh, about the leadership of, of institutions. So we're talking governmental, religious, uh, business, private sector, everything. You're saying that because uh, baby boomers are retiring, because a whole strata of leadership for so long is retiring and going away that that we're we're gonna we're gonna face a real crisis of identity is that is that the, the idea you hit it right on the head and you said going to retire but i would fast forward and say have retired those of sure. us that were born between 1946 and 1964 i mean there were millions of us and we've gone through our careers now and we've left behind a group of current and next generation leaders that really need our help in terms of coaching and mentoring, uh, but most of us have left. And so, like so what said, about what about this? Where where somebody is like a twenty something right now? What if they say like, "Oh, good riddance! You guys are part of an old generation. You have old ideas, and I'm all into you know this new stuff. And you guys are really out of touch. Like, isn't this just kind of the same topic we hear generation after generation? You know that the young replaces the old, and you know there's always these warnings that we're missing out on something, but maybe. Uh, you know, the younger generation just, uh, you know, does it differently. No, not at all. Not at all. And the reason is, is because great leadership practices and principles and strategies are core to who we are as human beings, how we go about caring for people, how we value people, the timeless treat people, how they add value. And we tell them that we appreciate them. Uh, that's the core tenet of what leadership is all about. And it has to be taught. Uh, it has to be transferred. People have to actually see it in action. So mm. um, the warning has more to do with the fact that there are fewer and fewer and fewer of us from the baby boom generation in the workplace right now than there were five, 10 years ago. And the big concern is who's going to reach back and actually help the current generation to be the great leaders that we know they can be, but we have to be taught. You're not necessarily born with these skills. You have to learn these strategies and principles mm. in order to implement and execute. I were just saying, other than I'm, I'm part of Gen X, so I'm kind of sandwiched in the middle. Uh, you know, there's this big battle, I guess, between the baby boomers and the, the millennials. And like, I, I feel like I'm just, I don't know. I love the grunge era. I'm all a 90s brat. Who knows? I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the middle there. Um, but yeah, even me, I'm, I'm looking towards uh, retiring, uh, you know, um, obviously very early for myself, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that uh, in my life at, at some point. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody who works for me, they're all, you know, millennial types. Uh, and, and I try to pass on as much as I can, but there's also a lot that, you know, they show me and they, they do things a little differently, but sometimes it's even better and, and more innovative. So yeah. um, do you find that this is like, are you preaching down to them saying, hey, you got to listen to me. There's a there's something you're missing. Like, do you think they're doing it wrong or is it no. just is this something that you're getting from them? Like you have a whole bunch of people who are in the younger generation saying, hey, we need this. We're missing out on this. And, and you, you think that, that that older folks have to step up. Yeah, I would say it's the latter. I'm never, I'm never preaching down at anyone because we're always working collaboratively and in cooperation to make sure that the workplace is as best as it can be uh, and that these organizations are attractive and not repellent. And so what I mean by that, the, the better trained the workforce and the better the leadership within that particular organization, they become a magnet and more people want to come work with them. So we do this together. Uh, this, is, this is collaborative and in cooperation because we want to hear the ideas from the questions that are coming forth. Uh, prior to my retirement, when I was mentoring and coaching, I was getting a lot of questions from the future leaders, the folks that I passed the baton on to, mm -hmm. and they're still asking the questions. So my job is to avail myself 
to help them to be better communicators, to help them to recognize that we manage things, but we lead people. There is a difference. We don't manage people. We manage things, but we lead the people and, 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 and all of the dynamics that are involved with that. that that's, that's great. It that reminds me of, of a phrase, something along the lines of, of uh, uh, um, you know, use, you know, use things and, and work with people, never the other way around, never, uh, right. you know, never use people and work with things. Exactly. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's get down to the brass tacks. How do we actually do this? What do you think, uh, you know, let, let's say a bigger organization needs to do in order to actually try to mentor the next generation without being preachy, without talking down to them, without trying to replace them, you know, they're, they're you know, try to make a clone of themselves, actually let them have some autonomy. But what yeah. do they need to do to, to reach them? Well, some of the things that we can do together as we work together as a part of our training is we do a lot of uh, facilitating and a lot of classroom exercises. So open dialogue, open discussion, open conversation so we can teach each other about the principles of listening and communication. So you and I are having a conversation right now, and there are a number of people that are watching all around the world. But if we're not connecting, then we're not effectively communicating. And that has to do with leadership. Um, also, how do we go about influencing people, not necessarily from our position, but based upon the type of person that we are, the leader that we are. So we have a responsibility to make sure that we value people, that everyone feels like they're a contribution to the team, that they have something to add. And some of the basic things that people can do is just to make sure that we hear each other out, Make sure that their their input and their feedback is heard, uh, even if it's not received and executed and implemented. At least we want to be able to hear them out. And then making sure that as leaders, we're always growing ourselves so that we can grow our team and ultimately grow our organization. So all of those different mechanics and principles and strategies are sort of going on at the same time. And, and, and again, we're not born knowing this information that has to be taught. So those are yeah. just some of the things that we can do as leaders. Uh, those of us that have moved on and are now reaching back to do the training and the development, that's what we do. But like I said earlier, we do it together, not as one on a pedestal looking down. Now, how is this done uh, in a practical sense? Is this like are you suggesting people need to volunteer with their local organizations? Or I know you do this for a fee. You go into organizations and do – uh, leadership development training. And I know a lot of people that do that as well. Um, but uh, is this something that you suggest people volunteer or is this something that uh, they need to do in their own organizations and take a larger role in the community or, or what? Well, it's a combination of both. I mean, everyone is really not interested necessarily in being a leader or a manager or a supervisor. So no one should be forced um, but the reality is a lot of people do a really, really great job at what they do in their career field. They become subject matter experts, and then their bosses determine, oh, you need to be a leader now because you're really good at what you do. But they may be a subject matter expert, but they don't necessarily know how to lead people. And that's where we step in and help. So oh, it's, it's the Peter principle. You know, you know, you don't you don't make a person uh, become a leader, but a lot of our leaders end up in these positions because they're experts at what they do. They have the knowledge. Mm. And so we come alongside them and just kind of give them that help. But no, we, we never recommend forcing anyone to become a supervisor or to be a manager or a leader because there's a lot of responsibility involved there. What you're talking about is the Peter principle, that, that principle that uh, it states that most people who are in management positions are incompetent because – they were really good at the position that was slightly below them and they were so good they were promoted and people are always promoted slightly one level above their own competence level. So let's say, you know, I'm really good at sales. I, I hit these sales records over and over, then I'm put in charge of the sales team. But the problem is I might not be a very good manager. I might suck at managing, but I might be great at sales. So, you know, that, that sort of thing happens a lot. So you really think it's a training issue that people just – need a little bit of training in order to become a leader because they're inevitably, if they're competent at something, they're going to find themselves in that position where they are passing on their knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's no doubt that the potential is there for them to be a great manager and to be a great leader. But with the right grooming uh, and the right instruction and the right training and the right mentorship and the right coaching, they would be even much better. Think about this for a minute. 
Think about these athletes. So my family and I, we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to go to the Summer Olympics every four years. And we've been doing it since 1996 in Atlanta. And I get a chance to watch these world-class athletes represent their countries from all over the world. How did they become a world-class athlete? Through the a lot of sacrifice and commitment, a lot of training, obviously, a certain amount Absolutely. of genetic predisposition and talent, too. Absolutely. So it is in the workplace. We have, we have great potential uh, of young men and young women in the workplace today, in our churches, in our nonprofit organizations, in our government agencies all across the United States and the world. But they need the ongoing training and coaching and mentoring to be the best leader mm. in what they're doing. And, and, and that's, that's the analogy that we draw. All right. So I'm, I'm a big believer in mentoring. Uh, how does somebody go about this? If, if I wanted to mentor people, what would you suggest, uh, you know, in, in that situation? Well, I would suggest the same thing that I did. So when I was a young pup in the workplace, I would look to different men and women that were there that just had that look and just carried themselves in a very professional way. And I would just reach out to them and say, look, I would very much like to get to your level one day. Don't know how long it would take. Uh, but would you help me and show me some of the tips uh, to get there? Would you mentor me? And more times than not, they would say yes. Very few people in my career ever said no. That's some fantastic. Did, but very few. So, but that, that's somebody asking to you. What about on the mentor side? What's a way a mentor can try to help somebody? Should you look for people who are maybe like floundering or, or you know, disorganized at work and say, hey, can I – you know, give you some advice. I mean, how, how that's probably the more dangerous situation because, yeah. you know, it can be construed as very offensive if you just out and out try to, you know, mentor sure. somebody and help them out, even if you have good intentions. Yeah, yeah. We think alike. You're right. Those good intentions could go awry. So a number of organizations nowadays have uh, what they call a volunteer system where they have different leaders in the different organizations that are willing to avail themselves to serve as a mentor. Uh, and those younger individuals within the organizations are looking for a mentor and they'll just sign up for the list and uh, and they'll get assigned that way. And the two will work together to make the relationship work well. The mentor would feed into the life of the mentee and kind of help them along the way. One thing that I do recommend is uh, what's worked out really, really well for me and many, many others in the workplace is to uh, have a mentor that doesn't look like you and a mentor that's not in your career field and have them to feed some good information into your life because you don't necessarily want an architect to an architect. Why not have a registered nurse mentor a car mechanic? Well, now that, that's interesting. That kind of goes counter to specialization. You know, a lot of people think they do need that, you know, if they want to get ahead in architecture, they get an architect, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, they could, but they, when, when, the, when, when the more diverse the, the, the team is that, that helps us to get to the next place, uh, you're going to start to find out that you have a diversity of thought. You're able to see things through a different lens, and you're actually able to think much differently than you would. You'll think outside of your box when it comes to solving problems and making decisions. And so that architect to architect, they think alike, and that's okay. But it's also, you know, I, I actually, I actually would, I would add one extra layer to that. I would add politics. I think there's, there's a lot of people who look uh, very, very different, but think so alike. Yet it seems politics is the last final frontier of tribalism. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've, I've known a lot of, you know, very, very liberal friends, for example, that really benefited from having somebody who was very conservative in their life. And I'm not talking, you know, they're you know, necessarily like they voted conservative or Republican each time. I think there's a difference between Republican and conservative for that matter. But, you know, somebody who uh, who's talking about, uh, you know, you have somebody uh, talking about the, the, the role of the state and other people talk about the role of charities in the family, like kind of a counterpoint to some of the assumptions that we make, especially if you grew up uh, with some very, very hard felt assumptions you know, right. uh, having those things challenged, seeing them from a different perspective can be very, very enlightening. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Again, it helps us all to see this world through a different lens, and it also helps us to take a look at things from a different perspective, and mm -hmm. it makes us a much more well-rounded person. So that's why I recommend that you would often look for someone who doesn't look like you and is not even in your career field. 
Because no, they want agree to that. Yeah. outside of your box. You know, I actually, I actually had uh, some of the, the greatest impact in my life in, in terms of my thought process recently was, was a really good friend of mine, Sergio Gonzalez uh, over at, uh, in eBay. Uh, he, he's no longer working at eBay, but he's very much like connected to the whole um, Bay Area and the, uh, the, the, the um, Silicon Valley scene. And, you know, the conversations we would have are, are just absolutely fascinating where we're, you know, kind of in that Silicon Valley way of disruption and, and, and get rid of all of your preconceived notions. Let's start over. And I would talk about a, you know, a business mm-hmm. model that we're doing. And he goes, well, why are you doing that? Really? No, why are you doing that? Well, why are you doing that? And like, really, what if, what if all that's uh, not going to work out? What, what are you going to do instead? And like, what if that's really the completely wrong thing that you should do and you should be doing something completely different? Like just asking those questions that, that in any other context, I think would be incredibly offensive, but from him, his perspective yeah. and from that sort of disruptive perspective was exactly what I needed at those times. And now, now, you know, you, now, now you made a great point. So, so part of what he did and in, in having those sessions with you uh, is an extension of leadership. So in this particular example, he knew how to set the tone and set the environment and the atmosphere so that when you entered into this relationship, uh, no one would be offended because you sort of understood the boundaries. That, that, that's part of the art. And I try very hard to never be offended by anything. I find, yeah. it, I find it really well, difficult to find offense. And yeah. I usually think if I'm offended by somebody's actions, that's my failing, not theirs. That's the way I see it. Yeah, exactly. But however, uh, a good leader um, has to be aware of that. And everyone is not aware of that. And everybody doesn't, doesn't echo what you just said. Yeah, and that's yeah. a very important principle because of the society in which we live right now, where there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of anger, uh, social media, technology, et cetera, et cetera. People are on edge a lot more today than they were five, 10 years ago. And sure. we have to be careful with how we handle people. We just, we just really do. That's just the reality of where we are. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so being careful and, and conscientious of that uh, is, is really important. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, uh, I think there's some great ideas that you brought up. You know, uh, if you're a young person that wants to, you know, get involved in something and you want to get a mentor, then, uh, you know, finding people from different backgrounds with different perspectives is really important. Maybe also finding somebody in your field, but maybe that field is not right for you and you should think of somebody who challenges your thoughts. Work mm-hmm. on uh, not being offended by things and work on, you know, kind of opening your mind up and, and kind of like Bruce Lee used to say, you know, you empty your cup so that it can be filled. You know, if you, already think you know everything you can't learn anything and you can't really grow as a human being that's a terrible place to be so up your mind to that um any other final tips uh for any individual any young people out there um you know i I would also say you know especially it's very very difficult for for young men to find uh mentors nowadays uh and i find that a lot of uh of men learn a lot from mentoring i think i think that uh, not to you know, play gender roles or anything, but traditionally women have a larger group of people to have sounding boards around them. And I really find a lot of men are isolating themselves lately and it's really dangerous. Um, what would you say to them uh, on, on how to find a mentor that, that can really bring them out of that shell and, and make, help make them the best of who they can be? Yeah, well, again, I'll, I'll, I'll just, not for the sake of repeating myself, but I want to echo it again. When you see someone in your life that you kind of model you sort of emulate the way they present themselves and you say to yourself, you know, I, I think I would like to have a conversation with this person. Uh, don't hesitate to approach them and, and ask them the question. You'll be surprised more times than not because uh, people are honored to do it. Now, mentoring can also go the other way around. Now, our current and next generation of leaders, there's some outstanding and brilliant minds out there. They can also mentor those of us that are chronologically older in age, uh, yes. especially as we move into a new career field or we do something different now that we're in retirement. So it's not always the older person mentoring the young person. Sometimes it's the younger person who's absolutely brilliant uh, mentoring the older person that's trying to catch up and stay ahead. Yeah, no, actually, my, my example in Silicon Valley was very much like that, although I don't know. I don't really know if Sergio is older or younger than me, but it definitely is that that kind of younger vibe of disruption made me rethink some of my uh, preconceived notions. So it goes both yeah. ways. That's I think I can't really improve on that. That's a great way to end our interview. Thank you very much for being on the show. All right. Thank you.